wait for the, the, the slide to pop up, but this is some work uh, which we've done uh, in Capgemini with uh, GSK, and it focuses on an area that's of particular interest to us, um, which is the intersection of, of data-driven methods with uh, approaches which have a quantum computational com uh, calculation right at the core of, uh, of a particular application. And um, one of the things uh, that's quite interesting about this is it sort of it spans between um, different, different potentially the different tracks of this um, of 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 this uh, event because actually uh, there are elements of uh, of simulation in there. Although at the end, ultimately, the aim is uh, around quantum uh, or is around the optimization of drug molecules. And I think if at some point we get the slides up, it will be easier to show you. Oh, there we are, fantastic, aha. The answer is just keep going next. Okay, right, so, so, so where do we start with this? So uh, you'll see some review papers on this slide and they're all areas, uh, well at least three of them we're actively working on now in the quantum computing space. But these are all actually uh, review articles of AI approaches, of machine learning approaches to areas such as drug discovery, um, such as uh, battery design, um, such as carbon uh, capture. Um, and a natural question is posed is that are AI techniques in competition with, um, with quantum computational techniques or actually is there some way in which these two things uh, can come together quite naturally um, and, and uh, form a, a complementary relationship and our view is very much that, that that is the case that on one hand there will be a subset of problems for which a quantum uh, calculation at the core really improves data-driven approaches and on the other hand actually combining a, a, a quantum calculation in the core of a um, of a data-driven pipeline may enable us to get some value sooner um, from smaller scale uh, challenges on a, on a quantum device. So what are some of the properties that we would like? What are some of the requirements that we'd like for an end-to-end -end, uh, approach? Well, uh, we certainly want to be able to leverage experimental data. That's a, a key part of any, any data-driven approach. And in many organizations, in many R&D organizations, uh, this is a huge part of the investment, is the generation of data. We want to get the most out of the hardware and really put it to the best possible use, and that means generating features from that hardware um, which naturally lend themselves to scaling um, using a quantum algorithm in, co in contrast with a classical algorithm. And finally, we do want ideally an approach which is flexible, uh, can be applied in a range of different circumstances, and will scale as hardware continues to grow. So this, this, this is a sort of, sort of wish list. And then if I sort of share briefly our, 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 what our, our cartoon of our pipeline looks like, this is how we imagine these pieces might come together. So in the, in the context of drug discovery, taking a chemistry problem, finding an appropriate embedding model where we can focus on a core part of that problem in, in greater detail, that might be um, a reaction center, a binding site, um, then, using that effective model for this, um, for this uh, particular core of a problem, uh, running a quantum algorithm on a future quantum device, which is gonna generate not just a single point calculation, but an entire feature vector, which contains information about a problem which is relevant, so that we can then use machine learning, data-driven techniques in order to make meaningful predictions. The idea is this will be combined with experimental training data uh, up at the top, and then when looking at new designs for new molecular structures, we will be able to run the same pipeline um, and, and indeed then generate predictions for un, un, previously unseen molecular designs. And this, of course, is really rather general. This talk is gonna focus on, uh, on, on the GSK project, but actually there are many ways to embed, many ways to think about extracting features, and indeed many data-driven tasks. And I'll focus on a regression and a clustering challenge in this work, um, but we have focused on many other, other problems as well. So let me be a bit more specific. This is a, a series of covalent uh, drug-like molecules. Um, this is GSK's uh, um, own data on sulfonyl fluoride chemistry. And there are some 100 molecules in total in this data set. And they all um, have the property that they don't just um, bind uh, with a target uh, a protein of interest, but they actually form a covalent bond. And this means that uh, 
these can really, and this is a sort of ir irreversible process, and this means that this kind of mechanism can lead to really rather potent drugs. Now, one of the key challenges is navigating the space of all the changes to the chemistry, um, which can yield um, uh, improvements in properties, and one of those key properties is the reactivity of this step of forming a covalent bond. Now, one thing I just want to highlight, if you look at these molecules, I think you don't have to be a chemist to spot that they're very similar to each other, and that tends to mean that Classically, it's very difficult to apply a data-driven approach with classical features. There really isn't uh, much in classical cheminformatics that enables you to cluster these molecules or, or build predictive models, at least not on a small data set of around 100 uh, molecules like this. So now I want to just talk through the pipeline and how we applied a specific realization of it to this, uh, to this challenge. So let's begin with the embedding approach. Now what we did here was apply a technique called density matrix embedding theory. This is a technique which allows us to focus on a, a cluster within a molecule, um, which is comprised of a fragment, the part that we care about. And I'll come back in a second to what that, that is in this context. And then an effective bath, which captures the entanglement between that fragment and the rest of the system. And then the, the, the remaining degrees of freedom are really captured at the, the, the mean field level, and that's the, the, the wider environment. Now, crucially, a, a, a DMET model like this gives us uh, a Hamiltonian, which is essentially um, of the same form as a general um, many-body interacting uh, electronic Hamiltonian. So this is something that we know how to treat with conventional te techniques. And the idea is we'll get one of those effective Hamiltonians for every single molecule in our data set, and we'll be able to use that to generate features which are going to be predictive of, of, of relevant tasks. How do we divide the molecule up? Well, here's a cartoon of a molecule. And actually, one of the things you can see here is that uh, Every molecule has the same reactive group on the left-hand side, this sulfonyl fluoride um, uh, functional group, which forms a covalent bond uh, with a reactive group on the protein. And so what we do is we use this as a fragment across the entire data set, and that means at every point we're able to compare like with like across the molecules in terms of the features that we generate. So how do we generate features? Well, there are many, many ways of doing this. Generically, we are looking at something which will um, uh, will for, be, be possible to create as a quantum circuit. So we'll be looking to create an initial state um, and apply some kind of state transformation and measure, measure some observables at the end of that. And this is, of course, completely generic, but because we want to be able to compare between different molecules, we need to keep a load of things constant and um, generate features in such a way that they pick apart the chemistry and the problem. So in this work, the initial state we actually took as the Hartree-Fock ground state, which is not the true ground state of the interacting system, and that's something that we can apply across the entire set of molecules. In terms of the transformation, we looked at Hamiltonian simulation, and this is really evolving this, uh, the, the, the electronic state of this effective embedding model over time using its own Hamiltonian. And then we looked at the one-body reduced density matrix, or effectively observables based on it, such as uh, one-body energies, and we measured these at multiple different times, and this is what creates a uh, a, a, essentially a, a quantum fingerprint, a feature vector that we're going to use to do downstream predictive modeling. Now, one thing to note at this point is that all of this uh, makes sense if you're looking for something which scales well on quantum hardware. Hamiltonian simulation is, of course, very natural to do on a, on a quantum computer. It may not be obvious at this point that any of this is useful, and that will be the focus of the rest of the talk. So this, certainly this, this, this scales well on quantum hardware versus classical. Does it help us in any way? Before I dig into that, let me just give a cartoon of uh, what we're talking about here. The idea is sort of pr from, a, from an initial reference state to look at the dynamics of the electrons on the reactive groups, the idea being that if the dynamics uh, are similar between two molecules, then these molecules will likely have similar properties in terms of the reactive groups here. If the dynamics is different, then they'll likely have different properties. How do we map out the space of differences in terms of properties we care about? Well, that's where machine learning comes in. These, these are the features that go into a model which will enable us to predict some of those differences. And in fact, with that sort of view of a data science pipeline, we even created a mock-up of a tool to allow people to explore some of the chemistry where it was possible to identify common substructures like reactive groups, create embedding models, uh, explore what those embedding models look like in terms of the chemistry, and ultimately generate features 
which go into downstream data science. So you can look at exploring different predictive modeling tasks, different clustering tasks, using the, uh, the, the features which come from, um, from this approach. And that's exactly what you're seeing now. And this started out as a sort of tool to express what this would look like, but actually our team ended up using the tool routinely to explore some of the different chemistries that we were looking at because um, it turned out to be really useful. And the one thing I'll say is we can't really do this in real time, so actually when loading up the data, this, these, are, these, are, these are cached results um, because even on simulators, Hamiltonian simulation takes a little bit longer. But there we are. There's, there's our quantum fingerprint in Fourier space this time at the end of the pipeline. So now let's turn to is it useful? Can we do anything with this? Well, one of the first things we looked at were the first eight molecules in the data set, and this is half of the Fourier space plot. And we found that seven of those molecules shared a common first peak. And one of the molecules, this one here, had a shifted peak. And given that the chemistry is really similar between these first eight molecules, this was a bit of a surprise. And we couldn't really explain why this should be the case. Then one of our collaborators at GSK pointed out that this molecule on the, on the left is actually a fluorosulfate. If you look carefully, carefully, you'll see there's an additional oxygen between the reactive group and the benzene ring. And actually, this doesn't belong in the same data set. It's a, it, it, it is the most distinct chemistry from, from all of the molecules in the entire data set. Um, and therefore, we have genuinely found an accidental anomaly. So that was good news. Some of these other peaks we found actually corresponded to different substitution positions on the benzene ring. So again, early signs were that the features tell us something about the, uh, the underlying chemistry. We then went right ahead and had a look at whether it's possible to predict um, the reactivity of the molecules using this feature set, and we got some really rather nice results, considering the active spaces are fairly small. So the red points are real experimental data. The blue points are simulations, but on a much uh, larger active space of the entire molecule using a completely different approach. So being able to pull out these uh, uh, predictions from, uh, from the dynamics of small subsystems was really a rather uh, nice uh, central finding. And we found that these results get better as you increase the evolution time, which is what we expect. We're providing more information. So the R squared goes up, the root mean squared error goes down. And similarly, as we capture more uh, molecular orbitals on the fragment, we go from eight spin orbitals to 12 spin orbitals, et cetera. Again, explained variance goes up, error goes down. Now, if it's really a quantum fingerprint, a little bit like a classical fingerprint in chemistry would generate as a feature set that allows us to perform a range of tasks, we expect that we might be able to cluster the molecules, and that's exactly what we find here. So if we look here, cluster 12, these are all naphthalene compounds. Uh, if we look to cluster 9, these are all uh, thiophenes and thiazoles, these five-membered substituted rings. And cluster four, they, these are all uh, four position substituted uh, sulfonamides, or nearly all of them are. And this is really nice. We see that uh, these features tell us something about the chemistry. Of course, everything I've just described you can see by looking. I mean, I, I, I don't think you need to be a chemist to see that these two benzene rings are common to all of these structures here. So, so what? Well, actually, it's the exceptions to the rule that are interesting. So if you look, for example, at molecule 161 here, this is actually... Um, an amide, not a sulfonamide. So with classical techniques, it, it wouldn't be put within the same cluster. And across the entire data set, there are quite a number of exceptions um, which cl from classical clustering approaches don't put the right molecules in the right clusters, but actually our approach um, puts, puts, uh, puts molecules with similar properties in the right place, which in, in itself is a really nice finding. As we're getting towards the end, I'll just comment briefly on, on how far we are, we are away from being able to do this. Hamiltonian simulation is a natural thing to do on a quantum computer, but it also has um, relatively large uh, circuit depths for chemistry. So we looked at trotterizing and looking at product formulas, looking at how, how many steps we'd have to put in in order to capture enough of the dynamics uh, to pick apart the different molecules. And you can see here, these are showing different levels of approximation. If we go down to a single trotter step, the two blue curves, these just about look different for two very, very different molecules. And if we look on quantum hardware with some off-the-shelf um, error mitigation, we can just about pick them apart if we uh, evolve to long enough time. So you can kind of see the green and the orange curves are, are slightly different in form. Um, 
And we've got slightly better results using Fire Opal, and we've, we've since uh, been pushing some other techniques with IBM to get this a bit further, but there is still a way off in terms of simulating chemistry. So where are we going next? Well, aside from pushing the hardware further and seeing how far that takes us, there are a number of other things to look at. We actually have, at the moment, uh, a master's student who is looking at the robustness of the pipeline to errors, because we have this data-driven um, element, we may not need to have uh, exact Hamiltonian simulation in this pipeline for it to be useful, and our early findings are that we do tolerate um, uh, errors to up to a point. Uh, there's a lot to do in terms of optimizing the algorithmic approaches. That's both in, from the point of view of embeddings, it's also in terms of how we generate the features and the choice of measurements uh, for, for a particular problem. We've already started to look at a, a wider range of chemistry uh, and, and indeed started to look at some materials application with these, these ideas and so far these are beginning to, to prove fruitful. Um, and in, in particular, we need to push beyond some of the simple chemistry in this example. So uh, this was a very nice data set where it was, it was very clear how to break up the molecule into component pieces that allowed us to compare like with like across a data set. Uh, that's not always going to be the case in, 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 in bigger problems, and there's quite a bit of work to do there to automate that kind of process. Uh, we've, begin to look at, we've begun to look at the intersection between data-driven features and quantum machine learning, and one of the, uh, one of the first steps that we've looked at there is uh, towards having circuits where we have features which are parameterized, and actually we learn the, uh, some, the optimal feature for a given task um, during the process, which is itself um, proving quite interesting. Um, and next year, um, with some of our, our colleagues in Cambridge Consultants, we're beginning to look at um, mapping out resource requirements in more detail, and indeed um, looking at some application-specific error mitigation techniques um, for this class of problems. So that's uh, interesting stuff uh, to come as well. So maybe I can just finish by thanking the Capgemini team and the GSK team and also um, acknowledging the NQCC in the UK who actually were supportive at the very start of this work and actually provided the seed to get this project uh, off the ground. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.